Cool. So I'm Teddy, CTO of RBI, Restaurant Brands International. Um, and we are a company that owns Burger King, Popeye's Chicken, and Tim Horton's Coffee. Um, big restaurant company. Um, we operate about 25,000 restaurants around the world, and we serve about a billion transactions a year. So um, th this is a company that, when we talk about our apps, needs to be able to support basically an arbitrary amount of users, um, sessions, transactions at, at a given time. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the Popeyes app. This is a React application uh, that we wrote. And before we talk about the app, I want to talk about the Popeyes chicken sandwich. <laughs> so um, this is a sandwich that we launched on August 12th uh, with a kind of now infamous tweet, chicken brioche pickles, new sandwich, Popeyes nationwide. So good, forgot how to speak in complete sandwiches. I mean sentences. Um, so this sandwich uh, is really good. I don't know uh, <laughs> if you guys have, have tried this sandwich. It, it is truly uh, a, a delicious sandwich. And when it launched, kind of one of the immediate impacts that we saw, people liked the sandwich, and they started to go to Popeyes in very high numbers. Um, so some of our competitors, not necessarily that thrilled about this development. Um, Chick-fil-A tweeted, bun plus chicken plus pickles, all the heart emoji for the original. Um, and, and in response, uh, Popeyes tweeted in typical Southern fashion, y'all good? <laughs> so this led to what got termed the uh, the Great Chicken Sandwich War of 2019. Um, this became uh, Twitter's conflict of the summer. And um, as interest in the chicken sandwich war grew, other brands kind of wanted to get involved too. You can see Wendy's tweeted, y'all out here fighting about which of these fools has the second best chicken sandwich. <laughs> and then Boston Market tweeted, customer, can I get something like Boston Market mac and cheese, but mediocre? Other guys, my pleasure. So <laughs> great chicken sandwich war escalated. And interest in the, in the chicken sandwich only, only grew. This is actually a real uh, screenshot of news footage from, from Grand Rapids, sandwich causing traffic jam. Municipal authorities very upset. Um, this is a, uh, a, a, a woman who tried 16 different Popeye's stores trying to find the, the chicken sandwich uh, with her nephew. Um, and I think ultimately found one uh, that, that was not out of sandwiches. And uh, even some of our great cultural institutions here in America got involved. The New Yorker wrote an article, the Popeye's chicken sandwich is here to save America about how our chicken sandwich was the only thing that could unify this divided nation. <laughs> so we ran out. We ran out of chicken sandwiches. Um, and if you guys were following any of, uh, any, any of the news, um, we very quickly sold many, many more times uh, the number of chicken sandwiches that, that we thought, and, which is an amazing problem to have. And so the brand needed to communicate with the customer base. Um, we're out of chicken sandwiches for now. We're working on restoring the supply chain. Uh, we'll have more sandwiches soon. I'm going to play a quick video um, that, that we ran on Twitter. Can we get sound? Mm. And the lines are crazy still till like five in the morning. Have lines wrapped around all around the corner. Oh my God, that's ridiculous. When you get like five million people, six million people on social media talking about this sandwich is good. What? No. We're sold out of chicken sandwich. We sold out in four hours. Love 
love that chicken from Popeyes. Let's watch it again. Just kidding. Um, so. So like I said, this, this is a React application. Um, and in a situation like what we have with Popeyes, um, there's a case where because of kind of a business reality that's unfolding in real time, it's incredibly important to be able to change the content on all of our digital channels quickly, right? And I think this is an interesting tie-in to some of the advantages that, that Jamstack offers, um, which we'll talk about in more detail, but just as an example, the marketing team at Popeyes was able to change their kind of app, website, from this find a Popeyes near you kind of generic uh, marketing content list of offers to chicken sandwich, be right back. And, um, and the team was able to do this without writing code, without involving engineering, without even really involving product, um, able to do it directly by modifying content, right, not code. So zooming out a little, um, you know, we own and operate these three brands, and the digital channels that we really care about are our web apps on desktop and mobile, our iOS and Android native apps, and our kiosk app. And we'll talk a little more about what the kiosk is, but if you've been into one of our restaurants recently, you may have encountered a device um, that's a touchscreen device where you can assemble your cart, order food, check out, and kind of a convenient, smooth way for people to uh, order food in this store, right? So website, iOS, Android, kiosk, and across three brands, right? Burger King, Popeyes, Tim Hortons. So if you kind of look at the scope of what our team has to worry about, you can think of it as 12 apps. And historically, that's what RBI has done. Um, maybe a totally different code base for Burger King website as you have for Popeyes iOS app. Um, and six of the 12 supported digital ordering, so e-commerce e -commerce apps. The others were maybe more of a static uh, application. Um, over five different agencies trying to write code and manage this kind of patchwork of, of different apps. And all the content data being managed in Excel. Um, and we'll talk a little more about what we mean by content. Of course, we do mean things like the home screen image, the headline you see on the home page. But in our case, content also means the menu data. What do we sell? Um, what modifications can you make to a Whopper versus ones that you're not allowed to make? And so our goal, um, and I should mention organizationally, um, me and kind of the other engineering folks that you'll meet at this conference joined about a year and a half ago in general. And our, our goal when we joined, try to make one unified platform as much as we can um, that uses shared React components um, and as much shared backend code as we can that's able to be styled by brand and by platform and try to make the content and data manageable. And this last point is key because in a big company, um, what we've found happens is the more painful it is to update your content, the less it happens and the less relevance the digital channels tend to have. And so if the marketers in your company kind of fear updating the website because it involves either using some ancient CMS or email an Excel file or like calling your agency who calls their sub-agency who calls their sub-agency who updates the website, it doesn't tend to happen very much. So as you saw, we've got the, the, the Popeyes um, web mobile app. And we wanted to look at the other apps pretty much the same way. So if any of you guys are Canadian, um, you probably know uh, Tim Hortons, very large uh, food and coffee company, primarily in Canada. Um, and, and same with Burger King, right? Try to have uh, a, a unified system that we can use across the brands um, in order to let us think of the apps in a similar way, even if the styling and branding is totally different across the brands, and of course it is. So the stack that we settled on um, is to use uh, React on, on the front end. And um, our, our code base is, uh, and our approach has been very heavy on web technologies and very heavy on the browser as rendering engine. 
talk a little more about that. Um, we use uh, a lot of Node Lambdas on the back end. We use a serverless framework to manage packaging of our Lambdas, uploading them. Um, we, we use a GraphQL API um, to communicate between our front end apps and, and our back end. And uh, we've set up, like I'm sure many of you, a headless CMS. Um, we use a, a great tool called sanity.io. Uh, we'll talk a little more about, about sanity, but um, with the goal of making the UX of updating the content as seamless as possible. And um, just to give you a little flavor for the app formats and kind of delivery modes um, for our code, we host our brand websites on Netlify. Um, we, uh, we use kind of the new generation of the Ionic Cordova um, world for our iOS and Android apps, and, and our kiosk app um, is a browser app using, using Chrome OS. So, I wanted to dive into kind of a code example. Um, I wanted to talk specifically about the icon in the bottom nav of our mobile and mobile web apps. And so if you kind of look closely, you can see we've got a maple leaf um, in, in Tim Hortons, we've got a P in Popeyes, and we've got the Burger King logo um, in the BK app. And so with the shared code base, like how do you manage that, right? How do you have a different um, icon render dynamically into the bottom nav. So in our case, um, what, we, what we do is we use the Webpack build process to conditionally load React components depending on the environment variables that are set at build time. So you can think about kind of this three by four matrix, right? We've got these three brands and we've got these four platforms we care about. And what we've done is we've set up our code base so that if you create a React component called like mobileicon.js, you can use the file extension um, to define mobileicon.th.js for Tim Hortons or .bk.js or .th.web versus .th.kiosk.js, um, right? And so um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have used Webpack. You know that you can control uh, a prioritized list of file extensions that Webpack will actually include into the bundle at build time that enables you to conditionally uh, render different parts of, uh, of the app. And so, um, so, so to take the, the, the mobile icon as an example, these are SVGs in the code base that, um, that, that Webpack is going to bundle or not bundle into the app depending on what environment variables are set. Um, so you can look at, at these style of components. Um, we've got a uh, brand logo component um, that, that's conditionally built into the app. And kind of the other key thing that we've done with our code base is to try to, um, try to separate cases where we need to conditionally load a React component from cases where we actually just need to load something from a theme value. Because in some ways, our app is similar to maybe a Wix or a Squarespace, one of these site builders, where you, all you need is a configurable theme if all you're controlling are colors, typefaces, styles. You may not need to custom load a totally different React component. You may just need to access a theme value and load maybe theme.color, theme.primary typeface. So um, the other thing you know, that's helpful for us is you can, we, we've been able to nest these kind of conditional loading uh, concepts so that maybe you have a, um, you may have a case where the elements in the bottom nav are actually different by brand. So our brands care because they're different types of food or drink, they may care differently about different, different types of functionality on digital. Example would be Tim Hortons is a daily coffee. Uh, they may care more about loyalty, whereas maybe Popeyes may care more about deliveries. So, um, so we're able to define um, even kind of the outer component, the, the, the nav component, um, in a custom way, and then inside that, still load the icon in a custom way. So you end up with kind of a nesting hierarchy of, of custom components. So I wanted to come back to content um, and, and talk a little bit about customizability. Um, this is something that I think when people start working on, on food apps, um, maybe on e-commerce in general, they don't totally realize just the level of um, 
of customization that these apps allow a user to do, and therefore, how many variants of a, of a Whopper, let's say, can you actually order? So here's a case where, let's say, uh, the user, they say that they want to order uh, flame-grilled beef. They may uh, pick a Whopper, and then they may want to order that in a combo meal format. Um, they may have a different side and drink that have different uh, sizes themselves. And then within the sandwich, they may add tomatoes, remove onions, they may remove lettuce. You actually end up with this fan out effect of different variants that you can order, um, which is really important to manage well if you want to run the apps. So play a quick video here of um, something that we've set up in order to help manage this, which is our, our content studio. And we focus both on kind of the developer experience side of this so uh, custom CLI that lets um, our developers kind of uh, run locally the content database and also the React front ends of the apps, um, our storybooks. And, and so we focused heavily on kind of the DX side of things and then also heavily on the experience for marketing because we want them to update the data in a self-serve way and we want them to do it frequently. So you can see us running Yarn Dev, and then, um, so just to, sorry, we'll uh, restart this video. But you can see us running Yarn Dev, and then the developer selecting, okay, I want to run locally the Popeyes app or the Burger King app, and then I want to run it in the dev environment or the QA environment, staging environment. Or, um, you know, I want to run it with or without the storybook to edit the React components or the content studio to, to edit the data. And you can see a user on the right, kind of a marketing user, maybe opening up the tenders meal and adjusting the content. So one of the key things that was important for us to get right is the schema for the content. And this actually took us a while to figure out. Um, what we've figured out kind of is that if you look at fast food me menus, they do kind of conform to a predictable schema. Like you usually have a bunch of sections maybe. You have a section called chicken, uh, one called beef, one called drinks, one called sides. And then within that, maybe you have a bunch of items which are organized into different types of formats, combos, they can be modified in different ways. And so one of the important things for, for us to do as we started building the apps, is establish the data schema um, for kind of what comprises a menu. Um, and one of the nice things um, about our CMS stack is that it auto-generates the UI for marketing to use based on the schema. One of the things that we've valued um, about our, our partners at, at Sanity so far is the ability to swap in our own custom React components for parts of the Content Studio interface. Um, we've really prioritized the UX for marketing to edit the data. So it's helpful for us if, um, if we can write our own front end for parts of the, of the data management interface, especially as the data gets super nested and super complicated. So you start thinking about, OK, I'm adding mayo to my burger. Um, in what increments can I add the mayonnaise? and what are the nutritional values for each of those light or very light or very heavy mayonnaise increments. So the data starts to get really detailed and it starts to get really complicated. And so it's very helpful for us to be able to swap in our own React components that simplify parts of the editing experience for the marketing and the food innovation teams. So kind of our big picture result um, here, and, and this is kind of a true north for us, is to have our e-commerce apps and, and our digital experiences be driven by the business folks that actually run them and actually own the sales results. So maybe in contrast to um, what people have had to do historically where tech kind of has to be in the update loop for a new menu item or a change to, the, um, to your web interface, what we've tried to do is empower the business groups in our company um, to make those updates themselves. And, We've done that both because that lets them uh, drive our business forward better, but I think also because it's an act of self-preservation. Like, there's not that many of us. We're running these three global brands, and it's really important for us to equip the, uh, the business groups in our company 
with these self-serve tools so that they don't come knock down our door every time they need to update the homepage because they're out of chicken sandwiches or um, allow for a new type of customization to a, to a Whopper. Um, so kind of our, our guiding philosophy has to try to make the tools as self-serve as we can. So just to show in practice what we mean here, um, this is the current Popeyes website. You can visit Popeyes.com and, and use this application. Um, and so these are, this is the, the output of the data that, um, that our marketing teams have, have put in. So a bunch of sections, maybe limited time offers, chicken, you know, um, family meals, seafood, sides. And then as you drill deeper into the ordering experience, you're looking at the front end React application rendering the underlying content data. So if, um, let's say, the nutritional data, pricing, availability changes for these items, um, these are things that happen in the content layer, not in the code itself. And so when, uh, at, you know, for instance, when we run out of chicken sandwiches, um, you know, you may see items uh, that appear and disappear from, from our application. And, and that happens very frequently. And especially um, as our applications expand in their scope, both geographically in terms of the number of devices screens we're running on, it's really, really important that this be able to happen seamlessly. So in terms of our kind of big picture findings for running Jamstack at kind of the Burger King, Popeye's, Tim Hortons scale, um, number one, developer experience really important in enterprise too. People in big companies are used to kind of muddling through these pretty bad development processes where um, it takes a long time maybe to preview changes, run your app locally, see uh, you know, a lot of interconnected systems, very difficult. We've tried to simplify this and, and create a developer experience that's much more reasonable and much more similar to uh, what people maybe who work in smaller companies or environments are used to. Um, number two, Jamstack has so far been a really good fit for kind of the organizational dynamics that, that we see in the enterprise tech and marketing groups. Um, and, and what I kind of specifically mean by that is the separation of code from, from content. Because when you've got um, different groups that maybe own different parts of the stack, it's really important to empower kind of the other folks in your org to directly own, whether it's the pages or the e-commerce you know, product items that, that they're responsible for, for running. And, um, and then third, your stack can kind of make or break your ability to execute in real time. So, when we, when we, because these brands, uh, and as you kind of saw from the Great Sandwich War of 2019, because these brands are operating, um, you know, no longer on the scale of maybe I publish a new item or I adjust my menu or I adjust availability every month, every six months. Um, it, it's, you know, the the kind of e-commerce world that we increasingly live in. Um, it's important to be able to make updates in real time, and so the way you set up your stack can kind of make or break that ability. And I think it's important to set up your stack anticipating that, OK, it may not happen today, but a couple months from now, someone from marketing or PR, someone from communications, they're going to want to make a change. They're going to want to do it in like five seconds. So I think it's really important to anticipate kind of the organizational dynamics and the speed at which you're going to need to make changes and set up your stack accordingly. So we're excited to meet. You guys, um, we're here, a bunch of us from the engineering product groups. Um, we'd love to answer any questions you may have about our stack or our food. <laughs> and um, we're, we're, we're growing the team uh, primarily so far in uh, Miami and Toronto, uh, but also in other places. And uh, we'd love to meet you guys. Um, so please find us during the break. Thanks so much.